Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another year community meeting. Uh, this morning we'll have uh, Benoit taking up on some of the things we we almost got to last week, and you know we'll discuss on like the like Erie's uh, building kernels as well as you know how micro kernels fit in with Erie's compilation flow. With that, Benoit, off to you. Thank you. Oh, that's the echo. Um, need to take care of the echo. I don't know. What, <laughs> I, I, my mic is disabled, is muted on my laptop. So I don't know what more I can do. Uh, you're on your speaker, yourself as well? I, I think I just muted you. Try yeah, oh, now. sorry. I, I get it. It was the, the speaker on my laptop. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're off. Um, there you go. Okay, so we're rebuilding kernels. <clears throat> Okay, so what's a built-in kernel? It's just a function. Like, as a first approximation, let's say it's just a C function, except it's you can implement it however you like, um, as opposed to something that's generated by ERA compile. And the interface is memory to memory. So it's a C function or like something with the interface of a C function that implements an op for some definition of an op in some dialect with a memory to memory interface. So like this is a dummy example uh, for an element wise add on floats. It would be literally the one liner, except that you could then also want to provide some optimized versions. Um, it is currently part of the area runtime. Uh, oh, or oh, statically linked into Kojin. Thank you, uh, Ben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. <laughs> Um, so I prepared this slide over the past hour, um, this whole slide deck of, over the past hour, and then I sent a link to Ben 10 minutes ago. So I'm going to run into all the uh, pixels that uh, Ben made uh, with you. Um, so the being like being handwritten can be like motivated by either like performance optimization or targeting targets that don't have an NLBM backend. We'll, we'll get more into the pros and cons later. They reside in the uh, source directory in Erie. Oh, sorry. When I click, it moves slides. Thank you. Um, so um, it resides in this uh, directory here. Uh, and Ben wrote a nice readme there, which you could read. Um, and I call these things kernels. Most people call them micro kernels, but before I call them micro kernels, I would like to ask, like, if this is a micro kernel, then what would be a non micro kernel? And I really honestly don't know. So if you want to discuss that now, we can do so, but <laughs> otherwise, I will call them kernels. I think the intent is these operate on much smaller portions of the data than a normal kernel would, um, with a much more restrictive interface than a normal kernel would normally have. And so these, these are designed to effectively operate in, on the CPU's case, like L1 cache as opposed to the entire thing. And so what, what that means concretely is that things like parallelism, um, you know, in allocations, and anything you would normally do in a, a kind of heavyweight kernel processing a lot of data um, happen outside of this. This is the innermost loop um, inside of some loop nest or parallel system or, or something like that. So I think, I think that's the, the micro data, I guess, maybe. maybe. <laughs> My micro working set. I see, I see. Okay. <laughs> so how how do we call kernels? So the, the idea is eventually we could call them from anywhere that we have a use for them, such as for example cogen in the middle of cogen where everything else is otherwise generated by the compiler. We could have for some specific things um, a pattern that would uh, insert a call to those uh, built-ins. However, at the moment, the only vehicle for these kernels is the VMVX backend. And even then, you have to pass a non-default flag to enable those micro kernels. So the ERIC compiled flags are given here. And the way it works is after bufferization, there's a pass called lower lineage micro kernels that writes lineage ops to VMVX ops. It has to be after bufferization, because the whole point of this VMVX ox is to be a trivial mapping to the uh, built-in function core, and the built-in function pointers 
And the only way we can give it a pointer is if we already pass buffer z. And then there's, uh, there's a, uh, a bunch of uh, convert VMVX to VM pattern that will write those VMVX ops to VM.core ops. Yeah, so what what's important there is v, VMVX is is one consumer of the microkernels, um, and we we will have more of those code, code gen being the big one. And today in code gen, we are doing something similar to this. So for things like libc calls that LVM insists on emitting, um, like floor F sometimes or or float sixteen to in sixteen kind of conversions, um, we currently emit those. Uh, offline and then link the bit code in statically into the code gen, um, statically link them in, let LTO run, inline them, uh, dead code strip the ones we don't use. And that's what ends up at our final code gen shared libraries. Um, the idea here is we basically be doing the same things. Instead of libc calls via muscle, they would be these micro kernels that, that we would be writing. So we, we do at least have the most of the infrastructure in place for that, but currently VMVX is the only consumer of these. So I, I think pre previously there was VMVX was microkernels, but it, it really is just VMVX is one way to call the microkernels. Uh, code gen would, would be another way. No. And for, for, for those who are not familiar with VMVX, it's basically when you do eerie hard target backends VMVX, you get um, something that runs in a bytecode interpreter. Well, a byte default, that's going to be a, a bytecode op being dispatched for every single scale -up operation in a model so that the default is really slow, um, but the idea is that with the micro count rules, uh, we take uh, the slowness out of uh, important ops uh, one by one, and <laughs> maybe even one day VMVX uh, will be fast enough to use in, in practice. <laughs> um, so yeah, why do built-in kernels? Um, so each has pros and cons. Actually, like, it's, depending on the audience, the, the most typical question is either why building kernels at all or why code gen at all. Like if I talk to my friends who, my, my, <laughs> my, my, uh, the other people working on the handwritten uh, neural network frameworks, uh, um, they, they ask like, why do you do code gen? And I do fully expect that uh, why do kernels at all is also a reasonable question. So um, the idea is that we don't want actually to advocate for one over the other as being better than the other. Actually, we we, we do plan to combine both. Uh, something that we probably envision uh, is um, that on, on, on say, ARP64, you know, uh, we could have a module that has a built-in kernel for matrix multiplication and maybe one or two other critical ops, and then cogen for everything else. Um, but it's also fine if you don't want any microkernels at all. And it's also fine if you have an exotic target for which there isn't even uh, a LLVM backend. And then microkernels can offer a way to target this kind of machine. Um, so it's going to be too dependent. Yeah. I, I like the way you frame that because it, it really is the equivalence of like nowadays when it's like, you know, why, why write C at all? Why not just write assembly versus you know, why only write C and never be able to use inline assembly? And any complex project, you know, will will end up with both. And I think I think that that framing is really good. Yes. Um, uh, one one important thing to keep in mind is we will likely never end up in the case where we never do code gen, uh, just because that's that's really hard. Yeah. Um, I think it's fair to say that part of the motivation for something like Erie is that. Like, we, we, like we, we all come from the background where we spent a few years dealing with pre-ERI, pre-compiler things that were like libraries of kernels like TensorFlow Lite and things we used internally at Google before TensorFlow Lite. And, and <laughs> I, personally, I personally spent years maintaining um, this kind of library of kernels approach. So I have like painful direct experience with how hard that is to scale over years. So yeah, Cogen, <laughs> Cogen is needed. Um, but sometimes uh, building counters can be useful. To so with that out of the way, we can still enumerate a few specific pros and cons of counters versus cogen, so that it's clear that we are not advocating for uh, everything replacement. Um, so counters are good for exotic targets without LLVM backend. Yeah, that's true. 
um, like I, we mean like typically some accelerators, maybe some some you could be the hardware team designing the new chip from scratch. So that isn't an LNVM backend for your chip because you're the only person in the world who knows your chip, you know, and and you can have a chicken and egg problem uh, between software and hardware there. Um, optimal performance, you know, sure, like there will always be some cases where it's easier to get optimal performance out of handwritten assembly than to write the cogen patterns and, and fix any issues you run into with cogen with performance. Uh, it is totally possible to generate absolutely anything with cogen, but with uh, sufficient uh, effort in engineering in, on the compiler side. So sometimes for some people, it will be the better compromise to handwrite assembly. Um, and then I, I mentioned also, oh, uh, Suraj, does this enable uh, reasoning about fusion involving both kernels? So uh, actually, I'm, uh, Ben, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, so there's, it, it depends. Um, so when, when we are linking these into code gen and we're statically linking them and we're, we're doing a full LTO pass, it is possible that LVM might magically be able to do some detection and, and do some fusion there. Um, but the, the intent mostly on these is they're just like C calls. And so it'll be memory to memory interfaces. And so a fusion there would mean a unique kernel that you know, if you had two Linal jobs, you know, Matmol and add, you would have a Matmol add kernel or a Matmol kernel that could add, um, as opposed to the expectation being that there is a Matmol kernel and an add kernel and those end up fused in some way um, mm -hmm. automatically. Um, again, LLVM, when we're linking these all together, might be able to do that in some cases. Mm -hmm. But um, the other, other thing this provides, and uh, just on the performance thing that's really nice, is predictable performance. Um, so if we handwrite one of these kernels and compile it, it will always be that kernel and, and work that way um, versus in some of the cases with code gen where you can fall off performance cliffs if things start to fail to vectorize or you spell registers in weird ways or things like that. And so even, even if sometimes, you know, there are benefits from getting fusions performance wise, um, you know, if 99.9% .9 of your model time is spent in four different microkernels, having those be consistently good in all cases, regardless of the model is, is an, an interesting use case. Yeah. I, I can, I, I have personal experience with that because um, I, I, so I spent years at, at Google writing library of kernels, um, new network inference frameworks and their matrix multiplication backends. And I, you know, I. I, I, I never fully optimized to 100 percent of peak. I, I always struck some compromises with generality. And then XNN pack, I came along XNN pack is another Google open source neural network in France framework. And the XNN pack authors were way more serious than I was about you know squeezing the last percentage of peak performance out, out of that problems. And basically what what whatever my architectural uh, superiority was was actually insignificant compared to squeezing ten more percent out of the out of the kernel. <laughs> now, so um, Kujo, so basically, as we are currently um, um, designing these micro kernels, they are a memory to memory interface, right? So that that's basically a hard compilation barrier. Like there is no compiler that will remove these memory loads and stores that we have at the beginning and at the end of these kernels, right? Um, if we wanted to change that, we would have basically to stop writing kernels in assembly, sticking to writing them maybe in C with intrinsics, combining with LTO, um, something like that. So that's a possible, theoretically possible future thing, but the micro kernels that we are discussing today are plain code, memory to memory, straight fusion boundary. That means yeah, that cause... if we try to fuse something, we have to know what we want to fuse and we have to fuse it um, before we go to uh, to uh, rewriting to uh, built-in kernel ops. Yeah, because as soon as we would go to intrinsics, we'd effectively be just like normal code gen. Right. Uh, so there were multiple questions. Um, Okay, I just opened the conversation panel. So Morley has a question. If we just target VMVX, we can either lower that further using more passes or directly generate new kernels. The decision on how to lower VMVX could be made later, right? Ben? Uh, not, 
not sure I understand necessarily. Uh, I mean, uh, why do we have to decide it has to be microkernels? Why, why can't we just target VMVX, which ha has interfaces for microkernels, as well as uh, potentially other uh, things uh, uh, like simple loads and stores or whatever, and then uh, we can take the VMVX code and do one more cogent pass from it to either target uh, normal CPUs or we can target microkernels directly. Uh, so v VMVX. Um... The, the VM that we're running on, whether that's our bytecode VM or we're emitting C code via the emit C dialect, um, is a inherently scalar architecture. Uh, and so we we effectively, as we're lowering from Linalge, go go through just enough to get those microkernels out and then go straight to scalar form. Um, so it's it's not easy or or viable to ever go back to a vectorized efficient form from that. Um, when you want to do that, that's what the full code gen path is for. That goes through the vector dialect and does additional levels of tiling and, and things like that. So when when you're going to VMVX, you're basically saying, I want to run in a ultra portable, you know, no executable code required at runtime kind of environment. Um, and the cost of that then is that you lose the performance benefits you get from the code gen side of going to vectorized forms. Um, once we're able to link the microkernels into both code gen and VMVX, um, then you don't have to make such a binary decision as to you know that that thing. Um, the, importantly, everything up to the point that we actually do this is the same between both paths. And so, um, in general, any model that we can compile via code gen, we can we can compile and run via VMVX. It's kind of our reference backend. Um, and so, as a user, you wouldn't you wouldn't see a difference between something running and not in in either configuration. It's really just do you is your deployment scenario such that you want to ship a, a binary file that doesn't need executable pages at runtime? Um, or uh, do you actually want full performance and, and what that entails? Does that, does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, one follow-up question, sorry. Uh, what, what is uh, the uh, thing which gets lower to microkernels? Uh, as in, what's the layer after which you generate microkernels? I guess that was uh, what I, I was meaning, not VMVX per se. Uh, do you have an example of any IR in here, Benoit? Um, I, can, I can follow a link, actually. I have. We can also take it offline. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a, uh, an example uh, IR here. It would be particularly enlightening. What are you looking for? Uh, I no, no. would uh, was just I see can, if you had the dialects or something. Maybe I can just answer this question quickly. So I think uh, currently it's being handled at the Linage op level after bufferization because it's a memory to memory interface. Uh, so that's the current implementation. Uh, there might be a place in which you could do it earlier, have a representation of this goes to microkernels without bufferizing it, uh, and then uh, manage it uh, so that after bufferization, you do call the same kernels, but that's still a little bit farther out. You need to explore that a little bit more. But right now, it's a Linalge op after bufferization and before vectorization. And Thomas had a question too. Right. I mean, it was follow up to um, basically you were saying it has to be a memory to memory interface, or it is right now a memory to memory interface, uh, and that prevents fusion. But is there any reason why we cannot just make it like uh, a register interface so that we could actually fuse things? Two major reasons would be that, well, a couple. So one, one is that if there might be a, a layering in here. So if we have to call this from something like VMVX, it has to be memory to memory just because there, there are no registers. Um, and so we could have two layers of one that was presented a memory to memory and then one that was lower level that was used by it that, that did vectors. Uh, the tricky thing that that exposes in, and I think Benoit touches this on, on, on this in some future slides, is um, that breaks the insulation of target architecture features. And then also in a lot of cases when you're writing these microkernels, uh, one of the things you actually care about is your register placement and where where you're loading registers and where you're storing registers from. Um, and exposing that on the interface basically takes that control away from the microkernel. Uh, so so it, 
it, there, there is a world where you could imagine a decomposition of these if you had like load and store microkernels as well as map all microkernels and uh, effectively something that looked a lot like the MMA uh, kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but that gets fairly complex and then starts to edge out of the territory of the predictable performance of yeah. handwritten code and more into generic code gen. If I had to do it, maybe the way I would do it would be to go to inline assembly. Like so far, I've been writing, I've been writing C and out of line assembly. But if we, if I wanted to retain almost all of the characteristics of um, out of line assembly and expose the register interface, I would do LLVM inline assembly. You know, the like it's actually exposed in MLIR uh, inline assembly. Oh, I think thanks to Nicola. Um, and I've been using that before starting working on with kernels. And so we can have a inline as an op that, you know, it takes uh, actually a vector, uh, vector SSL uh, variables uh, in and out as registers within the inline assembly snippets. And um, yeah, we could do that. Uh, we don't usually care about the placement of the in and out registers within the register space. Um, most architectures or registers are equivalent for that for these purposes, so why not? But it would be a bit of an investment to like it, it's way easier to just have out of line assembly files. It will also be friendlier to the typical hardware team wanting to port to their target. So that's probably why we haven't mm -hmm. done on this. Yeah, we also have the advantage here of like. At, at the granularity that we're looking to use these at, they wouldn't be like a single element or eight elements or something, but ideally, you know, hundreds of elements, if, if not more. Um, and so it, in most cases, you wouldn't have potentially enough registers that wouldn't clobber in, in order okay. to do that. So, I would that, actually, no, that's, that's the key. And actually, let, let's, let's give an example. We're going to get into that. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Zay, in a way, it's an ABI. All machines ever are going to have a void star. Some machines will have 64 bit registers, some will have 512, some will have 256, and we would have to capture that somehow in an abstraction to make that work. Right. And the other element I wanted to uh, draw attention to is I mean, your kernel is computing a small tile or a register size tile, like maybe eight by eight, if that's how many you can fit in registers, in a MATMO. Okay. So the output is fixed size, say eight by eight, but the input has a dynamic k dimension. That's the number of iterations of your innermost loop. And you have this dynamic dimension um, that basically means you've got, at least on the input side, you've got to consume memory input, right? If you say, I want register input, then you can't have this loop as part of your kernel anymore. And you're back to the way we're doing it in Cogen. Well, we have a vector dot contract, and we lower that to um, intrinsics or something like that. And like basically, we're, we're back to like I, I, this is a big topic in itself. Basically, the issues we run into with vector contract lowering, but basically, requiring a vector a register on the interface also for the inputs uh, would make whatever we're doing equivalent to vector contract lowering. Right. Yeah, a out output vector might be interesting. But so you could, a, a yeah, take memory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah. usually yeah. you want to fuse um, with the output, right? So that, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that that's a, a good idea and something we can can definitely explore. Because besides things like a scatter or something like that, we can generally do that. Um, the hope for for a lot of this, and one of the reasons why these are kind of sized at the granularity that they are, is that we're staying in at least L1 cache, um, and so it's. It's memory to memory, but hopefully because the entire problem space has been distributed and subdivided, um, almost all of these, at, at least especially on their output, um, are writing into L1 cache. And then if in code gen, as soon as it returns from the microkernel, it's either calling into another microkernel or doing vector loads to perform some, some code gen stuff, um, that's all going through cache. Hopefully it's all right combined and you know it's right through caches. And so uh, hopefully everything's pretty good. But it, it's at least better than you know, a, a kernel interface on an entire problem size where, you know, if you have two element-wise kernels and it was going through a megabyte of, of memory for each one of those in a loop, you, you'd be cold caches the whole time. Um, here, once we're distributed on multiple cores, each core has its own local local caches, and uh, hopefully we treat the memory subsystem a little bit better in those cases. Uh, Suraj has another question before he leaves. Um, 
restrictions on how the kernels are presented, just C, C++, can it endure letters that I don't know? I don't know what BYO is, so go ahead. <laughs> bring, bring, bring your own. Um, so yeah, we, we have a couple, couple different um, ways that those things can come in. Um, the tricky things, once you get to something like Spear V or, or GLSL or something like that, is that they don't have a very good linking story at all. Um, and so generally, you know, you'll, you'll end up with two kinds of things. You'll end up with like a header file equivalent that you want to bring in um, that you can call. Uh, and I think that's roughly the equivalent to what we're talking about here. Um, so it would be, you could bring functions, you know, snippets of GLSL or, or Spear V or something. Um, that you could link in uh, as as to the code gen. Uh, the other case is entire kernels, um, and those those are trickier because the kernels then have interfaces and expectations around bindings and I/O and stuff like that. Um, but I think I think for the case of the kind of times in in an OpenCL kernel where you pound include something, um, this is basically that. Um, so we we could offer a similar interface in, in the GPU backends for that. Okay, should we uh, continue with the uh, slides? Um, so we weren't quite done with this one, but I think we basically covered it by talking. Uh, the trade-offs mentioned in the middle of the slide, yeah, sometimes you could do something very well in Cogen, but it would require, you know, making the compiler code a bit more complex or a bit bigger and just for the needs of one particular target. Um, so sometimes if you have one target that has very specific you know requirements due to its cmd ISA details then actually throwing um a kernel at it is a way to prevent those cmd ISA details to for, prevent those details from making the compiler more complex for everybody else um sometimes it's a matter of code complexity but sometimes it's also about installation of target details and we'll have an example of that in a later slide Kernels are bad for what Cogen is good for, so fusions, we discussed that. And, you know, scaling to all the ops across all the targets, you know, this 2D matrix that has been held for the library approach that people like me were working on before joining Erie. You, you have a thousand different neural network operator types. Uh, you need to target dozens of different target architectures. This doesn't scale, Cogen scales. Um, kernels inflate the error on time to the extent that they are part of the error on time. Ben had edited uh, my statement earlier. It can also be static linked in the, the model. Um, so that also means a constraint. Uh, when we write kernels, we have to optimize for code size, uh, not just for performance. We'll see that later. Yeah, part, part of that is just selecting which things actually get kernels. And part of the hope is by being at kind of the microkernel interface where we're still inside of a loop running from CodeGen, that CodeGen is driving, um, that we have an opportunity to, to decompose these things to the point that we have on the order of dozens as opposed to on the order of hundreds or thousands. Uh, Renato says, uh, go ahead, Renato. Uh, no, sorry. It's just uh, I, I got uh, uh, on this slide. I haven't seen the previous slides. Uh, we, we we're just talking about big kernels, right? Why they are bad, not the micro kernels. We're only discussing one kind of kernel at all. Some people call it kernel. Some people call it micro kernel. But we're discussing the flavor of kernel that we are adding to area at the moment. Well, because the I whole point of the micro kernels is that you 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 have the power of the cogen to block tile and do all of your transforms and the power of the microkernel that is just to call in that a by eight block or something that you know is efficient in cache and etc. Yeah. And okay, okay. So so that's that that's that's basically why Ben calls this a microkernel. That's what we're doing. We're doing microkernels. Okay, um, perfect. I didn't know the terminology, so I just shortened that to kernels. But I okay, now that I understand that it actually means something to people, I will edit this and put the use in front of the kernels everywhere. Thank you. Yes, because if you're writing like a CUDA kernel or an OpenCL kernel, is a giant thing that only works for that one problem in that one GPU. So ah, okay, okay. So that's the where the terminology comes from. Okay, okay. I'll just add the use everywhere. Okay, well, the, we do mean micro kernel everywhere. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, next slide. Um, okay, so kernels initially target details. That's one potential pro of kernels that I mentioned on the earlier slide. Um, so kernels have a memory-to-memory -memory interface, so that's the trade-off. You, you you give up on fusions 
And in exchange of, 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 for that, you get to insulate a lot of SIMD details. Actually, you get to insulate all of the details except for the data layout. And then on that point, even data layout, you get to insulate some of that due to the next point. When you write a kernel, a microkernel, you can you can put the boundary for your microkernel anywhere you want in the loop nest. You can decide what's the boundary between what's part of the kernel and what's the outer non-kernel code calling into it. So you can, if you need to abstract a little more data layout stuff, you can actually make some data swizzling, some data re-layouting, part of what your kernel does. And you can do that while retaining good performance because you get to choose the boundaries. So you get to put just enough loops into your micro kernel to amortize this kind of swizzling. Uh, often, like in the case that I ran into, as I described here, just the innermost loop being in the kernel was enough. Um, so here's an example. ARCH64, so that's ARM64, with a recent SIMD extension called I8MM. It's part, it's implemented on the Apple M2, I've been told, and it's implemented on um, on the new um, new Qualcomm source, new, new um, mobile uh, ARM architecture um, CPUs um, starting from end, uh, end of last year. So in particular, I have a Moto Edge X30 uh, recent um, device. It's less than one year old. It has a Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 uh, SOC, and that, that supports this extension. And this extension does a 2 by 8 by 2 matrix multiplication. So the left hand side is 2 by 8, the right hand side is 8 by 2. And accumulator is two by two. And that's not the first time that we have seen the instructions specifically for speeding up some matrix multiplication. But it is the first time on ARM that we have a, a, an accumulator register that is itself a matrix with a size of more than one in, in both dimensions. For example, before we had dot product extension that was four by four by one. So it was a matrix times vector, but the accumulator tile was still the vector. Now, for the first time, the accumulator tile is a matrix. And that's uh, that's going to be the norm. Uh, ARM SME goes way far farther in that direction, and um, looks a lot like um, I, I'm not familiar. Anyone who knows GPUs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does does a lot. Right. So I think yeah, that supports my point. Um, everyone is going in the same direction of true matrix multiplication instructions. Um, and that includes GPUs, like you say, and that includes ARM and um, everyone. Um, so what does that mean for how we abstract that in either a cogent or a kernel approach? I actually wrote a, a vector that contract lowering to inline assembly targeting this instruction um, six months ago. But then, because my vector contract was 2D, it was like, a vector contract on, on 2D vectors representing the LHS, RHS, and accumulator matrices. So they, they were row major matrices. And, and so the, the vector swizzling had to be part of the vector contract lowering. Now, it would still have been possible to, um, you know, to, have, to, 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 to have further uh, cogent patterns uh, sorting that out and still obtaining optimal code for this case. But it would have required writing more uh, patterns, and it would have re required not writing this um, th this lowering in in line assembly. Oh, thank you, Renato. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so instead of by having a micro kernel, I can say, oh, my micro kernel generates an eight by eight tile, and yeah, the eight by eight tile is is row major as far as at the interface of the micro kernel goes, but the micro kernel will internally do the squeezing. And why is it suddenly low overhead while it was high overhead in vector contract lowering? It's because the micro kernel contains the whole inner loop. So we only have to squeeze at the very end of the loop once. Um, that's, part, that's exactly why earlier uh, and we discussed um, the uh, importance of having dynamic sizes uh, and that implied having a memory interface instead of a register interface. It's so only by having memory interface that we enable dynamic sizes that enable putting the whole inner loop in the microkernel that enables amortizing this kind of swizzing. And that enables 
hiding this kind of SIMD micro detail uh, as an implementation detail of the kernel. The the other thing this really it like kind of highlights what what this whole system is designed around is the compiler. When when we're talking about these micro kernels, especially when they're plugged in at runtime dynamically, um, we we wouldn't be able to generate code that that knew about these eight by two and two by two and, and values like that, um, because that would that would be a leak of the ISA details all the way up, and then we wouldn't be able to plug this in and run the same exact program on a, a different architecture. And so a lot of what we're going to need to do in the compiler, um, when we talk about things like propagating, packing, and padding, and things like that, um, is padding to the, the minimal or the, the maximal common dimension of these things. And so whether that's 8 by 8 or 32 by 32, um, that is what the compiler will be producing. It'll be passing those pointers into the microkernels, and it's up to the microkernels to have that inner loop uh, based on their architectural details. So something ARCH64 with I8MM, um, you know, might have a certain number of loops producing these two by two tiles versus, you know, a generic ARCH64 without this extension, which would still produce, you know, the same output size, but might have to loop a couple more times to do that. Uh, the important thing being the interface as exposed to the compiled program is effectively the same, regardless of how it's actually implemented under the covers. And there's there's definite trade-offs there, but um, when you're in this space and you're not doing code gen, that's kind of the trade-offs you come up with. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, to complement that, I, I totally agree. Uh, in the previous slide, we're saying uh, that uh, the, the compiler will be too complex. I think it's this is not the job of the compiler at all. It's it, because the way you would lower this is you would see an instruction. Oh, this is a matmol. I'm going to lower into this huge uh, uh, loop of instructions, and and that's just that doesn't scale, right? That doesn't work with register allocator with it, with anything. So it, it's not a thing that the compiler can actually do and should be doing. So the only way to go is to have microkernels and just expose the ranges and the you know the sizes and the shapes and the tiles to the compiler so the compiler can call the right microkernel at the right point. Well, and I, I think the important thing here is as much as possible, define the interface such that the compiler doesn't have to know um, in a lot of cases those things. Exactly, um, yes. You know, ju just, just the minimums. Yeah. Um, it's a tricky balance and there will be these cases where, where we end up with, and that's, you know, as, as Erie is a toolkit, you know, if, if you as someone coming in to use Erie know exactly which platform and exactly which architecture and stuff, you can you can very narrow narrowly specify that and you can end up with the minimal possible padding required and, and mm -hmm. waste of memory and stuff um, versus I, I'm just a random user who wants to upload a model to the internet and allow people to, you know, run my person detector model or something, um, yeah. in which case you'd go conservative um, for that. It's, it's worth pointing out, though, that for all the uh, detail insulating uh, capability that kernels bring, we're still, uh, you know, leaking all the way up the higher level of tiling, like eight by eight in this case, like here. Well, we're not leaking the two by two micro detail uh, tiling, but we are still leaking the eight by eight tiling that corresponds to the uh, register space level tiling. Um, that is a whole separate topic. So we're not saying that we're solving that particular topic here. Here we're just saying we we, we are um, putting a barrier uh, uh, to prevent this um, uh, existing leakage of ISA details from getting even worse. <laughs> yeah, and it, it helps here thinking of the hierarchy of these things is as we go higher up the stack, the things we, the granularity of memory that we care about goes up as well. And so, you know, at, at the highest level, we're caring about megabytes and then we're caring about, you know, hundreds of kilobytes. And at the point here, we're, we're really talking about the details around a kilobyte or so of data each time. Um, and so the, the concerns, you know, and how far that is allowed to leak up, it's fine if it doesn't leak all the way up because you know, it, when, when you're talking about a 10 gigabyte weight tensor, the you know exact swizzle details of four elements on the innermost dimension are kind of kind of moot. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So an example. Uh, it's, it's basically the only uh, the only uh, microkernel that I fully fleshed out, and only on AR64 plus the generic code. But it gives me an example to discuss. So uh, MMT4D stands for matrix to matrix multiplication transpose, so matrix matrix transpose, that's computing A times transpose of B. So that it's like matrix multiplication, except the right-hand side is transpose, and it's we are transposing the right-hand side because it helps implementations of matrix multiplication uh, stay a little simpler. But otherwise, 
think of it as just a multiplication. 4D is because this is a tight layout map model because it, it, it's meant to be uh, efficient. Um, and the way that, that we represented the tight layout initially uh, has been by using 4D tensors. Um, Mahesh and Hanhan are working on a more modern way that allows to represent um, tight layout map model without immediately going down to the details of the 4D shape. Um, but basically, think of MMT4D as just matrix multiplication kernel on tile layout data. And by kernel, I mean uh, not including the packing and unpacking work to go in and out of that tile layout. Um, so, so far, only R64 plus a couple of variants, plus dot prod plus I8MM. Um, optimized for code size, uh, for the reason said before, while well, still trying to be at 95% of peak. Um, another constraint is this has to handle both the accumulating model operation, C plus equals A times B, and the non-accumulating case, C equals A times B. Because on the one hand, lineage ops are perfect loop nests, so they are accumulating into existing accumulator values. On the other hand, the vast majority of practical models in ML applications are plain models. So in practice, the accumulating lineage map model is typically used with an accumulator uh, that was uh, just before filled uh, with a lineage dot fill with zeros. Um, and our microcontrollers have to do both because we want to support the, fully gen the general case of lineage map model, but we also want to be a little faster uh, in the case as well. Can be. And uh, this needs to stay simple, easy to port, um, easy to for anyone to hack and and port to, to the target architecture and generalize to other operation types. Uh, so yeah, I just uh, got into this uh, topic of to accumulate or not to accumulate. Um, so since I've already said it, I skip that slide. Um, so um, Eri, you can all MMT4D, or maybe I'll follow my link here. I'll actually, share this stuff. OK. I'll, OK, so see, um, it's just the entry point. So the high level work it does is it validates the parameters. And then it tries to see if there's some early return path that corresponds to the cases where one of the dimension is 0. And that's also where you would slap your own custom code for a port where you want to take over the whole implementation. Um, Otherwise, we go through our generic uh, path, which consists in selecting a so-called tile func. So this function returns a function pointer, or produces a function pointer in this out parameter to the function that will compute one tile. That's, that's, that's the function that we typically want to write in assembly. And so that function has only one dynamic dimension anymore, which is the innermost uh, k dimension. And everything else is fixed size, uh, say 8 by 8. And then we go through, uh, we're going to the generic loop nest implementation that we'll call that tile function for the enormous loop. Um, and so that's a single function that implements, you know, MMT4D not only for all SIMD IC variants, because that's abstracted in the tile fund for all, you know, tiling parameters. That's also a part of the params. And even for all data types, because since all the arithmetic is inside this tile funk. Uh, behind the indirect function call we're doing here, uh, the indirect function call here. There is no actual arithmetic in this function, so it can be completely type generic. Even like float versus int eight, the only thing that matters is the size of. Um, so that's that's how we achieve a good compromise of performance with code size. I do understand that it would be a little more efficient if we could specialize this function fully to each case. Yeah, and one, one of the things, this is where when, when we're statically linking these in and able to perform LTO, um, L, LVM is, it, at least as long as we do it right, pretty good about propagating those function pointers. And so it should end up being able to specialize those um, based on compilation settings of, you know, code size limits and stuff like that. So uh, I think this this case is, you know, the for the dynamic fully runtime specialized, you know, kind of architecture agnostic version. Um, and then the the stuff we'll do later on as we get this linking into code gen, we should be able to make the overheads that are there go away. Yeah. So I'll show you now a, a couple of assembly implementations of the tile function. 
or maybe I should show you the generic C code first. Um, but uh, anyway, like you, you can imagine what the generic C code looks like. So like this is this is a dot product. Uh, so ARC people plus dot product case. That's that's the the inner loop. So you see what it does. This is the loop counter decrement. Uh, this is loading uh, LHS tile. This is loading a uh, right hand side tile. And this is the multiply accumulates register to register. Uh, there is no stores to destination in the inner loop. The stores to the destination occur only at the end of the function after the end of the inner loop. Um, so for this particular case, um, it, 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 it would be perfectly possible to achieve a similar um, result in cogen. On the other hand, it gets more interesting for the I8MM case that we discussed earlier with this two by eight by two instruction that has the two by two internal swizzling. So here that's where it, it becomes a big deal whether or not we accumulate into existing values or we can just clear the destination. See, we do a test and branch uh, on the flag that tells us whether to accumulate. This is a non-accumulating case, which is zero registers. That's easy. This is the accumulate case. So we have to load the existing accumulator values, and then we have to swizzle them into two by two uh, uh, layout. So that's more expensive, but it's still not too bad because that's done once before we enter the inner loop. And so this function looks a little more complicated because I have optimized it a little more. I basically did a two exponential unrolling to um, use uh, uh, all of the register space to maximize load to use distance. But basically, uh, you get um, you, you get the typical uh, MATMOL inner loop where you have a lot of uh, arithmetic. Those are the MATMOL instructions. Each of these instructions does two times eight times two multiply adds. That's thirty-two multiply adds per instruction. Um, and this is loading data from the right hand side, and this is loading data from the left hand side, and so on. And at the end of the inner loop and all its epilogue stuff, um, we're finally um, sorry. That's the epilogue stuff. At the end, we are um, unswizzling back to raw major format and storing to destination. All right, so let me go back to the presentation. Yeah. Um, so, um, oh, go ahead. There's a, is there? Oh, sorry. Oh. I, I thought I had seen someone's hand up and I was trying to find out where to view that in the interface. Did anyone have a question? Is there a question? Uh, yes, I mean, I just had a, a, a quick one. In, in the Mumpton example you showed, you have a validate function at the top. What is sort of the expectation with respect to what validation will be happening in the compiler versus in the microkernel? Uh, do we actually expect the, the compiler generating these invocations to catch the majority of these? Or are there also some cases that we, we have to do a runtime check for? Yeah. Any Anything okay. that affects correctness is something the compiler should do, um, because we should be able to, in a lot of cases, statically figure that out and, and remove them. Uh, anything that changes runtime correctness, so memory safety and stuff, must happen on each call, uh, just because that's you know the, the whole point of this case through VMDX anyway is that you're running in a slightly more secure environment with memory checking and stuff. So. Um, I think that's a big difference. And then again, when we're statically linking and there's LTO and you know it, it can see all the constant parameters from all call sites, it should be able to fold away a lot of the chucking we're actually doing. Yeah. Does that and, answer and your question? Yeah, to, 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 to be clear, uh, by validation, I also mean just plain assertions. You know, um, even if it's the case that uh, the compiler should only generate valid calls and for any assertion I put on the parameters should never fail. No, I still want to have the assertions. They still need to be somewhere. That's basically what I call validation. Um, so in a sense, there's some release assertions there like that. Like not assertion because they just cause the function to fail and don't abort the program. But basically, there are some checks there that may not be techni technically needed, but they have completely negligible overhead. So I didn't have a reason to take them out. So uh, uh, Yongji has a question. Uh, do you want to go ahead? So, so I, I joined them later, but uh, how is different from intrinsics, right? If you write uh, all stuff in assembly, so it's, uh, it looks to me it's more easier if you program in intrinsics. Yeah, um, so for uh, a good um, reason, so 
it is possible to write any of that in intrinsics. The question is, what's the likelihood that the resulting um, binary will be just as efficient? It's very hidden. Sometimes it is just as efficient, and sometimes it is not as efficient. But the leading cause for not being as efficient is register allocation issues. Um, in the, uh, let me share again the, uh, uh, the tab with this kernel. So the, the key place is, See, so this kernel was 2x partially unrolled to maximize um, use of all available CD registers um, to maximize load to use distance. That makes this kernel uh, the, the hardest kind of uh, code to register allocate for in the compiler because there's only barely enough registers in the architecture to allocate all of these local variables. And that's assuming that the compiler did not perform some kind of optimization, some kind of code reordering that increases lifetimes of local variables that would make that would turn this hard but feasible problem into an infeasible problem. And in in my experience, that happens very often. Um, that you, you write this uh, register type C code assuming um, a mapping between your C variables and registers, and the compiler defeats you with some. Uh, optimization that increased register pressure, or in some cases, even without increasing register pressures, some, some somehow uh, fails to um, fails to uh, uh, get a good register allocation. There's another a, a typical way that actually this increase of register pressure occurs in in code gen is when some patterns introduce some temporaries that technically adds more local variables, so adds register pressure. But the intent is that they should evaporate before register allocation, but something that is enough to, to confuse a register allocation in a register type case. And with the register allocator trying to find a fixed point, it might, you know, just just spiral out of control rather than find a fixed point and then say, you know, I give up with this horrible code that I found. I'm going to stop here and it's horrible. I'm not even going to go back to the beginning where it was, wasn't yeah. that horrible. I'm just going to stop here. Yeah, when, when you end up with, you know, 20 spills and, and loads on your inner loop, it, uh, it feels bad. Yeah. So I, 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 we have two minutes left, so I'll just show you some results. So those are benchmark results for this I8MM kernel with the, you know, uh, with the 2x partial unrolling. If you want to see results with and without the 2x partial unrolling, uh, to justify this partial unrolling, you can click the results link here. It has the details. But the summary after this optimization is that we are, so this is, on my phone that I use as my go-to Android test device, a Moto Edge X30 has a Snapdragon HN1. There are three CPU Cortex. The little cores are Cortex A510. The big cores are A710. And the big macho cores, uh, just one of them is a Cortex X2. And um, the, the A510 are in order, and they perform one SMMLA uh, instruction per cycle. Uh, the A710 and X2 are out of order and perform respectively um, two and four such instructions per cycle. That's where you have this large uh, discrepancy in the peak gear ops. Uh, go ahead. Uh, no, someone asked a question? No, okay. Um, and uh, code size, so the total is 3.5 kilobytes. And the breakdown is this 2x partially unrolled I8MM kernel is bigger, it's 700 bytes. That's you know, that's exactly four bytes per instruction on this architecture. Um, a simpler dot port kernel is only 200 bytes. The generic kernels uh, are 500 bytes each. And so, yeah, we have a small total. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, this, this shows the kind of granularity of where the microkernels sit in the hierarchy and how we can, we can think of things where we might have 60 microkernels at, at some point one day for all the different kind of cases we want. Uh, but we'll still probably be talking about you know tens of kilobytes of code there as opposed to megabytes or tens of megabytes of code in, in larger kernel-based libraries. That's all I have. And, oh, uh, uh, Lorenzo has a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, this question is a little bit more long-term. So um, so the, the main sort of the main problem with the, this uh, microkernel things is that um, so most of them, for instance, require to have a specific, really out your tensor in a specific way or something similar. And so they're not really completely transparent to your cogent. So essentially also your cogent should be aware that you are going to target this um, microkernel to sort of really out your tensor in a, in a decent order. So how do you plan actually to address this issue here? Uh, because it, it's, 
it's not so easy to do. Uh, so and uh, these really out are quite expensive. So you actually want to yeah try to sort of hide as much as possible doing these things. And so you end up sort of having a code generator that also need to take into account this really out and propagate through all the network topology. Yeah, so to totally agree. And I think that is one of one of the reasons why we treat this stuff like we do, which is that very early on in the process, we need to know what we're we're doing things for. Um, but at that granularity, we don't yet need to know the exact tiled layout. Um, the only thing you need to know is that the data is going to be consumed by one of these microkernels. And the only thing you need to know uh, when you actually go to pack it uh, is that it has to be consistent. And so if you're packing, you know, if you have a pack microkernel and then you have the matmol microkernel, um, both of those need to be consistent. But from the thing actually calling both of those kernels, it doesn't care. It's just passing around pointers. Um, and so the, the architectural details are still lowered down and, and hidden in these microkernels. Um, the transformations we do at the higher level are really about moving where those calls happen, um, such that you know packing happens in the producer of data before we write it back into memory, um, and then you know consumers consuming it pull out that packed data, and as long as they're consistent, uh, then it works. And this is this is similar to how optimal texture layouts work on GPUs. Um, you don't necessarily care at any point in time what the actual device you know assigned the layout to be. Um, you only care that at some point you said to put it from a linear layout into an optimal layout, and then when you go to consume that, um, you're asserting that it is in that optimal layout, and it, it pulls it out. You, as the con the caller of those APIs, have no idea what the actual layout is. Uh, yes, but for instance, uh, uh, so, so but what does this mean? So let's say that you have you want to pack your matmol, right? So do you want to? Uh, or let's say that your microkernel is better, your matmol in a given layout. So you need to take, uh, so you need to relay out first before uh, calling this microkernel, and then you need to relay out after because otherwise you break essentially all the other operation that use your result, right? So not not necessarily like... all the other operations, right? So if you're performing an element-wise operation, um, okay. You know, it doesn't care what the layout is, and then this this is where we get into the the kind of details of like what we're what we're operating on here in the microkernels is a very localized region of memory, um, and so if you were to think of the original tensor, you know, instead of being by f thirty two, it was by you know eight by eight by f thirty two, and this is where MMT four D gets its four D right. from. Um, the inner eight by eight is an opaque. You know, data layout from the rest of the program. I can still transpose a matrix um, uh, that had okay. eight by eight elements. You know, at, at the global level, you know, and do a ten gigabyte, you know, transpose. Um, you know, treating each eight by eight by F thirty two as if it's a single opaque element. Um, and so, and and then as we propagate those across the program, you know, I can I can do something like fold that packing into constants and fold that packing into initializers and things like that. Um, okay. Yeah. One, even one even if it's a very far distance away when it's consumed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. One thing we thought about internally, like using the uh, this uh, VNNI packed BF sixteen, is if we have a matrix that is like eight uh, two by thirty two times uh, B packed BF sixteen, which is just a tuple of two BF sixteen. So your type will be a square of eight by eight. Will be your whole type. And then your matrix is a matrix of those blocks, right? So of, of course this is like tiling. Uh, uh, but the, I think the point is, if if this is a, 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 a multiply channel-wise or width-wise, and it, what is the the row major, column major, and this operation, you know, how does it operate, and where do you put in registers and etc. So I think there's a there's a lot of knowledge in the ISA and in the model that they have to share a common understanding. And there's so much variation on both sides that is, is gonna end up like this crazy list of attributes of lists of you know many things. So I think if, if you can, uh, uh, perhaps the easy thing is like we do in LLVM is to say, well, this target has property X and if has property X, I do this, I don't care what the shape in the end is, the target is telling me that this is a good idea. So I'm just gonna do it. 
right? It's, it's not the cleanest thing ever, but it, it is a way that you can simplify this middle ground where all of the, the combinatorial uh, effects are in play. Yeah, and that that's really, you know, Mahesh is, is putting together some some stuff for this now of, of we, you know, I know there's some stuff happening with the TPP work and stuff with packing. For us, those kind of packing operations are the things that happen inside of, of dispatches. Um, there is another higher, uh, another tier of the hierarchy above that is that is the packing that happens across the entire program. Um, and you can think of it just as like, you know, at, at the high level, if you're a user writing some C code, you're going to call a function that packs some data and returns you a packed, you know, buffer of data. Um, you don't right. actually care or know at that time what's on the other side. Um, and so I think I think that's the big thing that's kind of been missing so far is just that extra level of the hierarchy. Um, and I'm real, really excited for us to kind of get there because the same things, you know, you, you mentioned like the pack B floats and stuff is block sparsity is exactly the same kind of thing. Um, from a yeah. high level, you just need to know what your maximum buffer size is, um, what the actual consumption of the bits is inside will vary. And it's not even elements at that point, right? It's an index table with offsets with some yeah. number of dense elements and stuff. And so that is a completely opaque element from the rest of the system. You know, I can... I can slice and I can copy and I can gather and I can do a bunch of operations on those at certain granularities, like outer dimensions. But if you ask um, me for like a single element of a block, sparse block, um, then you have to do some work that's architecture specific. There, there are two or three outstanding uh, questions and we are already six minutes past the end. Yongshi quickly asked, uh, will assembly be the only way to write micro kernel? Actually, no, we, we had addressed that, I think before you joined. Uh, this is just an example of how I implemented uh, a couple of micro kernels. You're welcome to implement micro kernels in whichever language you prefer. The only constraint is you need uh, it to have uh, the interface of a C function. External C, yeah. Excellency. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, one or two uh, raised hands. Go, I, I guess go ahead, uh, Manish. Yeah. You, you're muted. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. No, we can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, I think your microphone might be disabled. And I think actually Benoit, my comment was just actually to when you add as well, where it's like, I think, it's, you know, thanks for the presentation. This was actually like really awesome. Uh, just in the interest of time, I think let's carry these over on like the discourse and discord and all, all the places. Um, I think very exciting. There's a lot of interesting work. And I mean, I, I love seeing 96% of peak. That's always a nice number to see. Uh, you know, thanks to everybody. Uh, we'll send out the, the video of this uh, shortly, uh, well, probably tomorrow. Uh, feel free to add more items to the, uh, the forum for things you want to discuss. Uh, roughly a month from now is actually the LVM dev meeting, so exact details of when the next meeting will be, you know, we'll need to double check. Uh, but, you know, glad to see everybody here today and, and see you next time. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yep.